So thank you all for joining us uh, for this bonus uh, session of the ISPD virtual education series. My name is Mayesh Chilani and I will be moderating today's webinar. We'll be hearing from Glenn Palamaki and Louise wilkins Haug. They will give us an overview of the recently published ISPD position statement, cell-free DNA screening for Down syndrome in multiple pregnancies. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping announcements to make. If you need technical assistance, uh, please use the chat function for support. Throughout the presentation, you can submit questions for the presenters in the Q&A function. We will address these questions at the end of the session. You can use the thumbs up button to vote for the questions you like most, which will push them higher up the questions list. You may also choose to raise your hand to ask a question, and if there's time, we will call on you uh, to, address, uh, to address your question. This event is being recorded, so if you do not wish to be recorded, do not raise your hand to speak or submit a question to the q and I will now pass, uh, pass uh, uh, it over to uh, Glenn. Glenn, over to you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thanks all of you for attending. Uh, it's uh, places it's in the morning, in the afternoon, the evening, and perhaps for a few of them in the, in the middle of the night. So. Um, thanks everyone for um, participating. So uh, these are the authors of the position statement. Um, uh, most of them will be available at the uh, end of the presentation to, to um, answer questions that you might have. <clears throat> so let's get started. Um, uh, these are the disclosures. They're all in the, the PDF, which is available on, uh, online. Um, you can find it through Medline or through prenatal diagnosis. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of those right now. So just start off, monozygotic twins. I wonder if anybody has any idea um, who these monozygotic twins are. Well, it's Victor and Vincent McCusick. And I'm sure you know Victor McCusick, the father of medical genetics, but Vincent McCusick was actually better known in Maine, where I'm, I'm broadcasting from now, um, as the Chief Justice of the Maine Supreme Court. So he was on TV far more than, than Victor was. And so I, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just an interesting tidbit. So monozygotic twins, that's kind of the, what we're going to be talking about, twinning. Uh, mainly twins, but certainly about triplets. This is the outline that is in the manuscript. Um, and we're gonna pretty much follow that in the presentation. Obviously we don't have to go read through it, but you can see the topics that we're going to be covering. <clears throat> so let's just start off with a little introduction and the aims. Um, the, uh, uh, these little symbols are to help uh, you know, understand that you know, it, it's not an I believe, it's an evidence-based approach we took. We tried to present the, the numbers, the values, the facts as best we could. <clears throat> we do want to focus mostly on Down syndrome. It's far more prevalent than trisomy 18 or 13, and we are not discussing things like microdeletions or sex chromosome aneuploidies. The other thing is we want to make sure that we're comparing apples with apples and not oranges with apples. Uh, and that is when we compare the performance of cell-free DNA screening in twins and triplets, you don't compare it to cell-free DNA screening in singletons, you compare it to other screening options that are available for twins and triplets. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, or second to last, uh, this is not an endorsement. We're not saying people should use only cell-free or cell-free is the best. It's simply presenting the information that cell-free uh, DNA, its characteristics when screening in twin and triplet pregnancies and the other sorts of information you might need to know. But certainly this doesn't say that the women should not be offered the option of not having screening or diagnostic testing or diagnostic testing or screening, first trimester ultrasound, all of those things are on the table. We're not saying this is the only option that ought to be considered. And finally, this was a kind of a consensus process as well, <clears throat> went, or, went around the table and batted ideas around and, and hopefully came up with uh, you know, reasonable conclusions. So if we look at the natural rate of um, uh, twins, um, it's about one in 89. Uh, which is 112 per 10,000. You might say, why, why is he giving me just one in 89? Well, interestingly, triplets are about one in 89 squared and quadruplets are about one in 89 cubed. And that was discovered back in the late 19th century. Um, and it's called Helen's Law. And the reason I show this to you is we're gonna use that as kind of the background or natural rate and see uh, what the rates are today and how they've been changing uh, a little bit later on, but uh, a, a rather interesting uh, 
conclusion there. So what are the rates roughly? How about some of the interesting bits of information? Um, monozygotics are pretty constant, about 35 per 10,000 deliveries. This is monozygotic twins. Natural dizygotic twins uh, vary with a number of things. Maternal age um, is a, a common one. Uh, multiple deliveries also vary um, by, by race, country. Uh, in Asia, significantly lower. In Africa, significantly higher. And there've been a number of papers, and again, you can look at these in the, the full report, that say Down syndrome should be more common in twin pregnancies, especially dizygotic twin pregnancies. Um, but observational data says, no, there's just as many in twin pregnancies as there are in singleton pregnancies. Um, Down syndrome, for example, in the first trimester is about one in 300 to one in 400 in both singletons and twins. And one way possible explanation for this is, the conception may be more common, but once you get into the time where you're doing screening, like late, second, late first or second trimester, uh, there's been a higher loss rate in twins and, and the rates are then similar to singleton pregnancies. So if we look at a couple of countries, here's data from the Netherlands, looking at twin deliveries over time, the horizontal line shows you the natural rate, the one in 89 squared rate that I just showed you a little before, and you can see the birth year going from 1990 to 2018 is the last observation we have here. And it's the number per 10,000. And you can see back in 1980, the rate was pretty close to what one expected. Um, uh, but wow, it went way up and, and then it came back down. That's interesting. And if you look at Australia, you see pretty much the same shape. Uh, it, the peak occurred a little bit later in Australia. Uh, and I don't know, in the United States, we seem to be behind in some things and there we're, the peak in the United States didn't occur until about 2010. So they all have pretty much the same shape, a, a steep rise in the 1990s and 2000s, and, and then a drop off. And if we look at triplet deliveries, um, you see something similar. The, the data are obviously far more sparse, so the dots don't correspond to the spline curve that well, and I don't think it really goes up. Um, uh, but it, it, it probably is more level. But again, you see a rise and a fall, a rise and a fall, a rise and a fall. Um, and, and the reasons for this will, will become evident soon. And, and uh, I'm gonna do the first handoff here and, and Dr. Uh, Louise wilkins Hogue will, is gonna take over now for a few of the slides and uh, uh, give you some more information about twinning and, and procedures and so on. Oh. Great, thank you, Glenn. And, um, you know, certainly looking at those um, slides of the rates across the different countries, there was increases and decreases, but here is a uh, high school class in 2020 made the Guinness Book of World Records. Yes, there still are a lot of twins, 44 sets of twins in this high school class. So I wanted to give you a little bit of information up front to set the clinical scene for um, what it means as far as twin pregnancies um, when you're looking for a Down syndrome and the implications of doing cell-free versus some other approaches. Next slide. So what is driving the increased rate of twinning that we've seen? Certainly, as you can see here, um, even through the 2000, through the teens, 14, 2018, um, maternal age, you know, is certainly correlated with an increased rate of twin births as maternal age increases, so does the rate of twinning. And then on the next slide, as Glenn had referred to as well, that certainly there's a difference in the rate of twins by the ethnicity and the race. And as he mentioned earlier, the rate is highest in Africa. And you can see here, even data from the United States shows that among um, the black race, there is higher rates of twinning followed by um, Caucasian and then followed by Latina. Next slide. So this is Louise Brown, uh, born in 1978, first IVF uh, child. And this is herself holding her own twins. So as Glenn mentioned, over the decades, there's been an increasing rate of twins. And then certainly, as you can see here, this was driven very much by um, the rate of IVF that was occurring across the United States as well as across the world. The next slide. 
So right now it looks like infertility management, um, not IVF alone, and we'll go over that a little bit, but infertility management itself probably contributes to about two thirds of the twins that we're currently seeing. Um, 20 years after Louise Brown was born was the first mandated reporting of IVF. So there was quite a lag before there was a realization of what the twinning rate was from the IVF cycles. And by 2000, and I think if you recall from the slides that Glenn showed, 2000 seemed to be kind of a watershed time when there was some changes initiated. And it was realized in the reporting that by 2000, half of all women who went through IVF had four or more embryos transferred. Um, certainly that was largely driving the rates of the triplets and certainly driving the rates of the twins as some triplet pregnancies underwent multifetal reduction down to twins. At that time, the um, IVF community really looked at their rates and the increased complications from twin pregnancies and said, what can we do to make this better? So since over the past 20 years, there's been changes in culture conditions so that they can now transfer on day five um, embryos that are more likely to survive. There's differences in the freezing process that's being done. And this has all led to fewer embryos being transferred. Next slide. And as you, can, as you can see here, again, right at around 2000, um, there was a change in the approach for IVF. And certainly there was a much greater emphasis um, on transferring single embryos. Before, as I said, in 2000, half got four or more. They really changed the approach 20 years ago and said, okay, whether you've only got one or you've got multiple, if you're um, a good candidate, then you should get just one transferred. And the next slide. And I think you can see here what this did um, to the rates. Again, in around 2000, the higher order rates, the triplets went way down. Um, and then the twin rates decreased a bit as well and the singleton rates increased. And that's about where we are today now, that there's a strong emphasis on single embryo transfer. Next slide. But I think, you know, a take home message is that we focus on talking about IVF and the, the pregnancies of multiples that come out of IVF, but really in vitro fertilization accounts for only a small portion of the twins that we're now seeing, about 15%. And a greater contribution almost a third comes from medical management, the Clomid that the general obstetrician uses, um, or even sometimes other medical interventions to increase ovulation is a much larger driver currently um, and always has been of the twins that we see. Next slide. So what can we do for uh, twins that want to go on to diagnostic procedures? And this is to give you a sense of some of the complications and the access that we have for diagnostic testing if we were to have then either a positive screen. So certainly chorionic villa sampling, here's sampling the placenta, you can sample the amniotic fluid, and you can sample the umbilical blood, all the same as you would do in a singleton. And the next slide. I think yeah, I just flipped, these go through fast. I think these are just a repeat. Oh, oh yep. dear me. Yep, <laughs> there we go. So what, are, so what are we doing then for diagnostics in twins. That's what we have available for singletons. What are we doing in, in twins? So we can do CVS. Um, the loss rates from a large uh, meta-analysis that was done about five, six years ago showed that the loss rate in twins was about 1% above the background. The other issue though is fetal misidentification. I, there's a much more rapid growth phase in the early first trimester for CVS timing, then there is an amniocentesis. So one has to be very careful about how they map out which sample they've taken from which fetus if the intention is to go back and have only one continuing singleton if there's an abnormality found on the genetic testing. So really critical. And then lastly, there is a, a concern about sampling error and it varies in the literature from one to 4%. Um, and then I think certainly next slide, one way to try to get around this is as you can see here, if you can um, have the setup to do it, you can do a transabdominal sample on one fetus. And then um, the next slide, you can do a transcervical sample on the other and really 
uh, assure yourself that you're sampling an anterior placenta close to the cord and then a posterior placenta close to the cord. And the next slide. But I think as you can see here, it can be quite um, complex to decide whose placenta does, uh, belongs to who if you're not following the umbilical cord insertions. Very thin membrane here. And the equator in this monochorionic placenta is not necessarily going to be right in line with where that uh, membrane is. So a little bit more challenging. And the next slide. We can also do amniocentesis in twins. Big systematic meta-analysis. Again, 1% above the background rate. The risk of fetal mis misidentification is uncommon, but you still need to map. And then um, we usually use uh, three points. So the next slide, we'll look at the location. You know, they call it A, B, one or two, upper or lower. You can use any terminology, um, but we'll also locate where the placenta is, and then we locate the fetus to the mother. So when we're getting this sample, um, we want to be sure we have tagged the right the right fetus. And then sampling error is very is very low with amniocentesis. Some people will clear the first CC um, to make sure they haven't cross contaminated. Um, in some areas, when there was availability of dye, um, they would mark the first sac with dye so that on aspirating the second sac, they had clear fluid and assured that they had a second um, fetus. A question also also um, often arises about sampling monochorionic twins. Um, certainly, I showed in the prior slide um, CVSs for monochorionic twins. Why would you do this? Certainly, if there's a positive in IPT, there's um, anomalies or growth restrictions early on in one of the fetuses, um, or if there's unclear uh, chorionicity from their first ultrasound, uh, sampling of both is probably uh, warranted. There can certainly be um, post-zygotic uh, chromosome changes that can occur so that only one of the two uh, monochorionic uh, fetuses actually has the chromosome abnormality. The next slide. So the role of trying to get an early answer in twin pregnancies is very important because if the individual wants to continue with a singleton, if there is a chromosome abnormality found, then the question becomes, how early can I get that information? And is that going to impact um, the risk that I will face if I decide to continue with a singleton and um, do a selective reduction for the affected fetus. The next slide. And I think you can see here, the largest difference actually occurs um, in gestational age at delivery. So unintended loss is about the same, whether you do it 12 to 14 weeks or you do it later 16 to 20 weeks. Where there gets to be more of a complication and, and morbidity is delivery that's um, very early and certainly there's a, a spike of remote or very early preterm delivery at 24, 25, 26 weeks. And then that's gonna drive your neonatal morbidity and your birth weights. So certainly the largest risk for the later um, procedures is that you end up with ruptured membranes uh, and that goes to a very extreme uh, preterm delivery. The next slide. What do we do though about the monochorionic twins? I raised this earlier with you know, saying, well, if there's discordancy between each of the twins, either in their ultrasound findings or there's a positive cell-free, there is the possibility that you can have aneuploidy that's restricted or confined just to one fetuses, even in a monochorionic, monozygotic uh, pregnancy. Certainly, um, the approach for reduction in, in dizygotics is to give a fetocidal agent. Monochorionics, that's going to cross over, so that's not the approach that we can use. And there really are two large approaches out there now. One of them is a bipolar cord coagulation. I think you can see here it's a relatively large instrument, three millimeter sleeve. And then the other approach is radiofrequency ablation, the um, operative uh, device is about half the size and then has the ability to have a widespread with an umbrella. The next slide. And what are the risks here? Certainly much more um, of a risky procedure for a poor outcome in the fetus than when you do selective reduction in uh, dichorionic twins. Um, the risk of preterm delivery is going to be higher with a larger instrument just because of the of rupture membranes and the size of the instrument. 
Um, and then next slide. The risk, however, with radio frequency ablation is that you do not get complete uh, synchronous ablation of blood flow to the fetus that is being reduced. And so you get concomitant demise of the other fetus due to the um, incomplete coagulation of the blood flow. Next slide. Ah. Glenn, back to you. Right, teamwork, here we go. <clears throat> okay, so I I'm gonna show you some of the results for serum ultrasound screening. As I said earlier, we're gonna try and compare apples with apples here. And so these are all uh, serum ultrasound screening results for twin or triplet pregnancies, not, no, no singleton data. And so on the x-axis, again, is the false positive rate. On the vertical axis is the detection rate. I've kind of zoomed in on the lower false positive rates because that's where the action is. And what we'd like to see is as screening tests improve, they'll go towards that upper left-hand corner at low false positive rates and high detection rates. So let's take a look at a few uh, options. <clears throat> well, the simplest option is just using age, like we started with for Down syndrome. And if you used age 37, and this is uh, using you, uh, United States 2018 data. So these are the age of women who have twins and triplets. <clears throat> and the detection rates in the order of, you know, 60 to 65% with 15 to 20% false positive rate. So it's, it's possible to do, and that's kind of where Down syndrome screening started in singleton pregnancies. Um, not great, but it's, it's doable. Uh, it's cheap and it's highly reliable. Um, so uh, how about second trimester, triple or quadruple testing? Now here the dots are in two different colors and they're in two different colors because the filled circles means that was the result of an observational study the open circles said that that was a result of screening, of uh, modeling. Um, and so you place a little more reliability. Um, and you can see that that has uh, much lower false positive rates, maybe a little bit lower detection rates. And the fact that it's kind of curving in the upward way makes sense as you increase the false positive rate, you increase the detection rate. <clears throat> so the reason that doesn't really work so well in twins is um, uh, serum markers are um, pregnancy specific and you really want a fetal specific marker. Well, the fetal specific marker obviously is uh, nuchal translucency. So now we're looking at some first trimester tests. You see the screening performance is significantly better and you can see a, a number of results on those dotted lines said anything around that dotted line is a 5% false positive rate. So there's both observed and modeled results uh, in, in certainly a, a higher performance level. Um, why is this better? Because again, uh, NT is fetal specific. <clears throat> so you will get, uh, um, you, in dizygotic twins, you will get a result in one twin that's different than the result in the, the second twin. Uh, the full integrated test uh, just adds, um, you know, second trimester, and it's, it's perhaps a little bit better. And, um, but I just do that for completeness. And just to kind of give you a hint on this, uh, this graphic where cell-free DNA in twins is, oops, I'm sorry, here we go. There are all the results we have. We're moving up toward the corner uh, and there's where cell-free DNA for Down syndrome is in twin pregnancies. And we'll show you the data that derives that, uh, culminates in that point in, in just a little bit. Methods of screening uh, in twins with cell-free DNA Really not much to say about that. It's the same methods as you use in singletons to screen. Um, and I, I, I throw this picture up here. I, I love this picture. This is from uh, Rosa Chu's paper in 2008. And it just goes through the shotgun methods where here's the red fetal fr fragments floating around and you take a sample, you sequence them, you put them in little bins according to each chromosome uh, after you've aligned them. Uh, and then you just look to see if there's more fragments counted for a chromosome than are expected. And if the fetus has Down syndrome, you'll get a few more bits of 21 fragment counted in the maternal circulation um, than if the fetus is normal. Um, and, and that same method um, can work with twins as well. Well, what about how well does it work? Well, there was a meta-analysis in 2019 by, uh, by Gill. Um, and uh, she included 3,780 twin pregnancies, 56 with Down syndrome. Um, but she excluded 
some of the case, earlier case control studies, and of course being published in two, early 2019, there were some studies after that paper, uh, that analysis was done. So uh, we just added a few of the earlier papers back in and a couple of uh, later papers that came out and we ended up adding 841 new twin pregnancies that were not covered before and 25, 24 more, I'm sorry. And if you add those together, you see you get uh, 80 twins with Down syndrome um, are in the literature. So if we look at uh, what the result was um, of the 80, and there are the 80, uh, you can see 79 were true positives and one was a false negative. So 79 out of 80 is 98.8%. Um, and that's where you get a, it's about 99%. False positive rate, there were only four false positives and over, over 4,000 unaffected twins. So false positive rate is gonna be a little less than one per thousand. Uh, there are obviously far fewer data for um, trisomy 18, but you can see it's 29 out of 31 or 93 and a half percent. Again, only one false positive um, and trisomy 13 uh, is it certainly doesn't have an enormous amount of data, but uh, three out of four uh, and, and a few more false positives. Uh, so it's it, it 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 works way better than serum and ultrasound screening. And again, just remind you there there's where we got a 99% detection with about a 1% false positive, 0.1% false positive rate. So let's just look at what the predictive values would be in twins. We have to do a little bit of uh, um, estimating here, but um, there are the detection rates that I just showed you based on a lot of numbers for 21, not so many for 18, not so many for 13. <clears throat> Rather than having those very small detection rate, false positive rates based on one or two samples, I just took the total rate, um, which is about 0.3% and, and just broke it up into three equal groups of 0.1% each. The prevalence in the um, late first trimester um, for these disorders in singletons, we know well, we're assuming that'll work in twins, and there are your predictive values, 75%, 47%, 19%, uh, 75% says basically three out of four, three-fourths of the positives will be true positives. And you say, well, gosh, 19% is not that good, is it? Well, let's look, what if you were using NT? and you were looking at trisomy 21, it has about an 80% detection rate a 5% false positive rate, same prevalence, 1 in 340, predictive values, 4.5%. So we don't look at cell-free DNA screening in singletons as the comparator. We look at what is perhaps the better option for twin pregnancies. And there it is, and using an NT measurement. And it really doesn't matter too much if you add age or chemistry, NT is the strongest predictor by far. Now, what about fetal fraction in twin pregnancies? Well, it's higher, um, but it's not twice as high. It's only about 50% higher. And there's lots of ways to measure fetal fraction. And the interpretation of it in twin pregnancies is a bit complicated. So for example, let's say you're a laboratory that measures, um, uh, estimates fetal fraction by, by Y. Because if there's any Y in the woman's circulation, you assume it's because it's coming from a, a male fetus or more than one male fetus. Well, if, if it's a, a monozygotic male twins or dizygotic, both males, that result is can, the total fetal fraction. But if it's a male and a female, it's a fetal specific fraction. It's just telling you the fraction that is being uh, produced by the male fetus. Uh, so even in this simplest case, uh, a number can mean two different things. Um, size base, sequence reads, methylation, these are all other methods for doing fetal fraction. They all will tell you the total fetal fraction and it doesn't matter what the sexes are and it doesn't matter how many fetuses. The, the, these methods will work in quadruplets and give you, you know, with half males and half females, they'll still just give you a total fetal fraction. There's some methods that use SNPs um, and um, dizygotic twins will have a different pattern. So you could actually get a fetal specific fetal fraction, but monozygotic twins will just have the same pattern. So you get a total fetal fraction. Um, and the assumption is that most always, but not always, monozygotic twins will have the same genetic makeup. I thought I'd just throw this in. This is not in the paper, but um, it, it shows again how complicated some of these things can be. Uh, this was a survey of 56 um, 
uh, CF DNA screening laboratories in the NIPT survey from the College of American Pathologists. <clears throat> and we asked them uh, what methods you used. And you can see that 54% um, of laboratories said they use sequence counts. Y was 43%, SNPs 29%, fragment length 29%. There were none that reported methylation. And even the simplest math will tell you that adds up to more than 100%. And that's because some people use sequence counts alone, 25%, SNPs alone, 25%, Y chromosome alone, 4%. But then over a third of labs use two methods. 6% of labs, three of those labs use three methods and one lab uses four methods. Uh, and what they put on the report, I don't know, but an important factor for the laboratory and the um, physician or, or provider to, uh, to help make sense of this is if they can give some information about chorionicity uh, the sexes of the fetuses and so on. That, that's helpful in trying to figure out um, uh, how to interpret the fetal fraction. Uh, just quickly, I wanted to show you that it, here are, you might say, well, if you have a, if the total fetal fraction is 10%, it could be one's one and one is nine. Well, that's not really true. Here's a, a, a set of results of 79 using the SNP methodology. So we actually have both fetal fraction estimates the dotted line is y equals x. The solid line is a regression line. We can kind of ignore that. And the red, the, the excuse me, the green circles are uh, the aneuploidic uh, fetuses. Um, <clears throat> we can draw a line at something like 8% fetal fraction. So the dots that appear to the upper right of that red line all have a total fetal fraction above 8%. Um, oh, I should have noticed also, this is not a real scatter plot. You see that the lower fetal fraction is always on the x-axis and the higher fetal fraction on the y-axis. So if you were to go straight up from five, that means the lower fetal fraction in five and everybody else above uh, that diagonal would have the second fetus having a value greater than five. <clears throat> so there are the, the two, the, the lower fetal fraction is around 6.4, upper around 8.1. Turns out that if you had used that cutoff uh, in that this population of 79 dizygotic twins, um, the total fetal fraction would have been over 8% in 89% of them, and all 10 of 10 aneuploidies would have had a suitable fetal fraction. <clears throat> Just gives you an idea that it, it's, it's not complete chaos at the lower end of uh, fetal fraction in twins. Quick meta-analysis of the test failure rate in twin pregnancies. These are sorted from the lowest rate, 1.6% at the top, um, uh, all the way down to 13.2% in, the, in, in this uh, last study. Um, and you can see the, the number of samples. One huge study from uh, Deere, but all the other ones tend to be a few hundred or, or fewer. Well, the consensus estimate is 5.6%, um, but the heterogeneity is very high. And that means that um, there's something else causing this, these differences uh, between the reports than random chance. And, and this is using the random effects model. <clears throat> so um, it, it could be the methodology. Uh, it, it could be what cutoffs are being used. Um, you know, some laboratories may say in twins, I'm going to use a cutoff of eight. Others might say six. Others measure, use SNPs and, and call it based on each of the levels. And, and that may be one of the reasons, but it's simply too few to explore this a whole lot further. <clears throat> and uh, here are the uh, CNA, CF DNA successes after an initial failure. Uh, this is uh, about 75%. The heterogeneity is very low, saying that really of the five laboratories on the previous page that provided this information, they all seem to give the same answer, um, that it's around 50, 60% um, will be successful of those that get repeated. So what about triplets? Well, let's say that you wanted, you say, well, we don't have much data about triplets. Well, we don't. Uh, in fact, I don't. I, we haven't been able to find a single triplet affected pregnancy in the literature that had cell-free DNA testing. So let's say we wanted to have 80 Down syndrome in triplet pregnancies. Well, we know that you need 340 triplet pregnancies in twins or singletons to find a Downs. Let's say that it's the same number here. Well, that means you got to screen 27,000 triplet pregnancies. 
in order to find AD Down syndrome with triplet pregnancies. Well, but triplet pregnancies aren't very common. You actually have to screen about 90 million pregnancies to get AD Down syndromes and triplets. And that's assuming that all triplets get screened. Right now, nobody is really formally saying that um, you should or could screen triplets. So that's not gonna happen. So what are the options for triplet pregnancies? Well, you could have an invasive procedure and uh, you know, um, Louise could, could tell you the additional issues related to trying to do amniocentesis or CVS in triplet pregnancies. It's even more complicated and associated with higher loss rates. You could do first trimester screening with NT or age as I showed earlier, but it's likely to have quite a high false positive rate which would tend to go to invasive procedures. Um, and the detection rate's not gonna be that high. Cell-free DNA testing, well, what about that? We're never gonna find the answer to it, but based on how we know it works, it should work in triplets if the fetal fractions are high enough. So it's likely to have a high failure rate, but the positives are likely to have a high predictive value. So we don't know a lot about it, but when you compare with what else is available to them, maybe it's an option that should be considered. And oh, I've missed, there's the NT and the cell-free DNA. So lastly, about educational materials, uh, for me, the, we looked at a few sites. We did not do an exhaustive search, but five commercial, uh, two academic sites. Uh, one of the sites had twins as a hot link on the top of the first page. That was great. So anyone uh, who was thinking about twins uh, or had twins and was interested, they could find a lot of material. There's lots of stuff there. Unfortunately, when you go through the grading reading level, I took a couple of them and it's between the 10th and 15th grade reading level. Um, that's too high. Uh, the next was they had search utilities. Well, you search on twin, you can get a whole bunch of, you know what those kinds of searches pull up, lots of stuff. And it's often not easily understood. Things come up like, um, posters from, uh, you know, meetings. Well, the average couple's not going to be able to understand that. And others actually had um, only a statement like the test is available for both singleton and twin pregnancies. That's it. That's, that's just not really sufficient information. So it was, it was very varying. Um, what should they provide gives you some idea. Give the same sort of information you do for singletons because it, um, it matters to, the, to those women as well. You can't say it's just, it's about the same. Uh, anticipate the questions that they would have, uh, and ensure it's educational rather than marketing uh, focused. And at the eighth grade reading level or lower, uh, in the United States at least, eighth grade reading level is understandable by about 85% of the population. And just to give you an idea, I, I threw in there, um, there's a sixth to seventh grade uh, reading level uh, pull out of a book. Um, and you can see that that is not what you generally see on, on websites or, or printed material. It, it, to get to the sixth or seventh grade level in this material is very difficult. If you can get to the eighth or ninth, that would be a, a good target. So, Louise. Okay. So just to take it back to how um, the group actually looked at what was out there. I thought I would give you a little bit of a timeline over the past five years as to which of the professional organizations have had anything to say about uh, cell-free uh, aneuploidy testing in, in uh, twins um, in particular. And certainly ISPD came out in early in 2015 saying they had similar performance to singletons. And if you got results, um, they would, could be interpretable. And the next slide. Oh. Yeah. This was followed, though, by um, other societies that said, wait, you know, uh, uh, ACOG and Smith, are two of the biggest ones that a lot of the maternal fetal medicine people look to and the general obstetricians, at least in the United States, they recommended not using cell free for twins because there was limited evidence or other societies said, you know, we're not quite sure at this time. And the next slide. And then societies across different um, continents really took more of a, well, let's, let's see at this time, we need more data. Next slide, still in two years ago, um, you can offer it, but we're still not sure, higher failure rates, all things that are true. And the last slide, 
And then um, certainly there's been more support in the past year from some of the European societies that yes, indeed, as ISPD said in 2015, you can screen for trisomy 21 um, in, in, in uh, pregnancies with, with some um, assurity. Can the next slide? And then since the ISPD position statement came out, there have been two other uh, pre-publications that we've seen. One is from the ACOG practice bulletin, um, given a level B recommendation that you can screen with cell-free DNA in twin pregnancies. And then also England recently released a plan for using cell-free DNA in singletons and twins. So I think, you know, it's, it's out at this point in time that certainly um, there is data with an understanding of the report that you get to be able to interpret cell-free DNA in a twin pregnancy. We thought we would just wrap this up then with going through what our recommendations were in the position statement and then including the level and grading of the evidence. So I think the first bullet point is that cell-free DNA for twins for the common aneuploidies is supported and this was felt to have moderate um, evidential support. And then positive cell-free DNA should initiate counseling and agnostics, clearly has a high level of evidential support. So certainly to consider zygosity when you're interpreting the results in the report, as well as the fetal fractions. And this again, had a moderate level of support that I think this is a crucial point in, in analyzing twin uh, pregnancies is your overall fetal fraction and zygosity. And then what to do with a second uh, sample um, when you have, I'm sorry, what to do with a test failure. If you have time gestationally, you can get a second sample or you can move to an ultrasound or diagnostics are all out there. And then lastly, um, we really just don't have any information yet for triplets, but certainly for twins and triplets, you know, diagnostic testing um, can always and should be offered. And then the limitations of all the screening tests should be stressed. Okay, so we have some of the members here from the, the writing committee as well to answer questions and I'll turn it back over to Mahesh. Thank you, thank you, um, Glenn and Louise for uh, describing our uh, position statement. We will now be joined by the other members as you can see uh, of the writing group uh, for Q&A session. As a reminder, please put uh, your questions for the presenters in the, I can see them coming in, uh, in the Q&A function. And you can use the thumbs up button uh, to vote for the questions you like most and they'll come up to the top and we'll address them as we go along. So let's uh, take the, the panelists uh, here. Let's take the first question. So, the first question is, how do you see the difference between patient education uh, resources and marketing material? Yeah, so, um, so, so I'll, I'll take that one. Well, yeah. So, um, so one of the interesting things, uh, certainly in the United States, um, in the context of, of, uh, of this kind of screening is that there's a shift away from academic medical centers um, who historically and traditionally have put together um, unbiased um, patient education materials, and um, and so as we um, as we looked at this uh, in uh, in the literature and uh, in what was available through uh, internet searching, um, it seems that there there isn't really much of a presence from the academic centers. And so one of the one of the things that that raises then is, you know, what is the motivation of the materials that are available? And it's very easy. Um, to um, to have things like marketing uh, uh, creep into um, into what is maybe intended to be patient education materials, so um, so this is uh, motivated because um, a laboratory would want to see more uh, tests come in, uh, perhaps they would uh, want to have an advantage over their competitors, and so um, what you'll see in those materials is that there is the subtle influence of uh, of marketing and persuasion. Uh, that really shouldn't be there in patient education materials. And, and I think that's the fundamental difference between what, what we would think of as marketing materials and truly patient educational materials. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, there's another question here that says, uh, what is your advice for vanishing twins? Hmm. 
Yoris, would you like to take this, Yoris? Yes. Yeah, thank you for this question. I think we uh, maybe vanishing twins is an aspect which was maybe a little bit uh, not uh, lighted upon because we were focusing on 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 uh, real twin pregnancies which go on pregnancy. But obviously, uh, vanishing twins are quite common. It's believed that about five to seven percent of all singletons are actually the consequence of a, of a twin pregnancy with a vanishing twin. And, um, and uh, obviously a vanishing twin um, will affect uh, the outcome or can affect the outcome of NIPT and we should be aware of. We know that vanishing twins is one of the major causes of, of false positives uh, in, um, in uh, regular uh, NIPT. And just as we have vanishing twins from two to one to singletons, we also have triplets, which result in in in, um, in in twin pregnancies, where you also have this risk of having a vanishing twin. So here, the obstetrician and obstetric uh, obstetric analysis actually extremely important to uh, to indicate that, and I think it's something we should be all aware of and, and, and educate our obstetricians to to report if there's any indication for that, because. Uh, is, is definitely uh, an aspect we should be aware of. I hope that addresses the question, if not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Joris. There's another question here that says, uh, can mosaic scores that are now calculated by many providers be of help to determine if one or two children are affected in a case as a result indicative of a trisomy? Uh, Eric, you wanna take that question? Yeah, I can take that one. It's uh, it's an interesting one. It's a bit premature right now to answer that because those mosaic scores or mosaic ratios they are well they're coming onto the into as part of the test right now. Um, but in theory, at least, they would be able to to help because if what a mosaic score means is that there is a relation between the Z score of the signal that you get and the fetal fraction. Um, so if you normalize it, it would be one for a normal pregnancy, singleton pregnancy with a regular, uh, say trisomy 21 present in all cells of the, pl cells of the placenta. So if you have a, uh, a twin pregnancy and you have uh, dizygotic twins and only one is affected, you would expect that mosaic ratio to drop uh, to say approximately a half in, in theory. But of course, we know that, that both placentas contribute differently to the cell-free DNA. So it can be helpful. On the other hand, it can still be a mosaic in, in, in two uh, uh, twins or a mosaic in one that is uh, whatever. So, so it will definitely not give you a final answer, but it might be helpful. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, there are a couple of questions here on fetal fraction, so I'll combine them. It, uh, it says, uh, should fetal fraction be included uh, on the report for all twin cell-free DNA samples? And uh, given the higher rate of the low fetal fraction of women with higher BMI, uh, what, do we, what do you think uh, providers should do when these women get an uninter uninterpretable result? Um, Rosa, uh, would you like to address that? Take that question. Um, okay, thanks, Mahesh. Uh, maybe I address the BMI question first. Um, sure. I think for the um, BMI, um, uh, the low fetal fraction associated with women with higher BMI, I think the uh, the problem we're facing is um, no different uh, whether we're dealing with uh, twin pregnancies or singleton pregnancies. Um, so uh, according to the um, literature that we've reviewed, um, as in the uh, recommendation of the position statement, um, if you have time, I, I mean, if the gestational age is still early enough, um, may, you may consider um, uh, doing a second blood draw and have another try at an IPT and the uh, success rate may be 50%. But I need to add a cautionary note here. The reason is because when, when we review the literature about the failure rate, uh, most papers don't break down um, the reason of the failure. So there might be a chance that um, those who do not get a successful result the second time around, maybe the women with high BMI. We don't know, we don't have evidence with that. Um, but also according to the recommendation, if um, the other option is you do have to think of other methodologies such as um, getting an NT by ultrasound. 
Um, so I think that problem is not unique to um, twin pregnancies. So as for the other question, should fetal fraction be included on the reports of all um, twin cell-free DNA? Well, this seemingly short question, a uh, simple question uh, may not have a simple answer. Um, the reason is because just having a number on the uh, lab report as um, shown in the, um, the presentation uh, is probably inadequate for the interpretation uh, for um, the results for twin pregnancies. So um, one first step is one would need to know the methodology that is needed, needed uh, that, that had, was used to generate the fetal fraction. And um, for example, if it's a chromosome Y uh, method, then Glenn has already given the illustration that it means different things if you're looking at one um, male fetus or two male fetuses. Um, but the other key part is that if you're working with a laboratory that relies on the, pro, uh, the physician to interpret the results, then you yourself will need to fill in the gaps with the chorionicity information. So for example, if you see a 4% uh, male fetal fraction, and if you're dealing with monochorionic twins, then you, that is likely to be enough for that twin case. But if you're dealing with a dichorionic twins, you won't know they may be dizygotic. And um, if they are both male fetuses, uh, then it's, um, unlikely, um, uh, well, you, you won't know. But if you are dealing with one male fetus and one female fetus, then you know that it is likely enough for the male fetus, but then you don't know if it's enough for the female fetus. And also I know that there are laboratories actually would do the, if you provide the chorionicity uh, and the field sex information in the laboratory, they may actually do all the interpretation for you. And they may not even release the result if they think that the fetal fraction is inadequate. So what I'm saying is that some laboratories may not have a number on the report, but they would have done all the interpretation in the back end, as Glenn has shown some labs use several numbers. So sorry, it's a, a little bit of a lengthy um, answer. Thanks, Rosa. Um, there is a question here uh, that says, um, the, ask the panelists, which uh, fetal fraction method do they think works best? For, to, for multiple pregnancy? It's a difficult question. Um, Glenn? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess you have to define best. Um, first, I think you have to understand that most of the fetal fraction measurements are relatively imprecise. Um, you know, and I think one of the main reasons a repeat test works is that the fetal fraction really wasn't as low as you thought it was the first time. It was just put to be on the randomly low for that, 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 that draw. And when you redraw it or do a second sample, um, you simply get a different answer. It's, you know, just an imprecise assays in most instances. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, that, that, which ones? Yeah, I guess you have to define best. You would like to get an answer in, you know, in almost everybody. You'd like to get multiple answers and see if they confirm each other. I don't know as any laboratories that measure multiple ways ever provides that information. They must choose one or average. I, I don't know what they do. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't think I can choose a best one um, in in twins, it might be nice to have uh, zygosity, but as you know, it's it's th there are other bits of information that could be very helpful as well, that uh, that would make other estimates of fetal fraction entirely sufficient. Um, I, I, yeah, so I, I can't I can't say one's better. Does anybody else want to say there's a a better method for some reason or how you would grade them? Yeah. Okay. That was a stumper. Uh, I, I think it, I mean, it, it's not the method. I think it's more important to work with a lab that has experience with um, handling uh, NIPD for twins. Yeah. And who is willing to actually, I mean, as, as I've um, alluded to in my earlier answer is that um, there are labs that just do the protocol and then report numbers. But there are also labs that are more specialized that actually ask for additional information to do the interpretation in a more consult cons consultative manner. So, so I think it depends on the provider's relationship with the lab that is more important that, um, so whenever you are in doubt, you can always ring up the lab to ask for more information. So actually that brings us very nicely to the uh, next question which says, um, what can labs do better in terms of reporting or, or uh, sending uh, aid 
national and international societies in making recommendations? What can labs actually do better? Anyone? Hmm. Can labs do better? Well, I guess I, I have to say something. I, first of all, for, for one thing, I, I think laboratories should report all the all the results that they got. Um, uh, there, it's getting better now, but in, in the past, a, a lot of laboratories didn't report fetal fraction. Um, they measured it and they said it was okay, but never put the number on the report. I mean, that obviously went into the interpretation or the ability to provide an interpretation. So from the aspect in the US of the clear requirement that if you, um, if you did a test, you have to put report and used it in the interpretation, you have to report the results of it. Um, and, and I think that should go probably for, if you do three fetal fraction tests and you somehow combine them together or use them together, you should make that clear on how it's done. Um, and in twins, it, it, it may be helpful to uh, have the laboratory say something like it's, uh, um, you know, additional information about chorionicity and fetal sexes could be helpful in the interpretation. Um, that might be helpful. Um, you might have some better ideas. Uh, not better, but more ideas. <laughs> uh, uh, because we expect uh, more failures in multiples, I think it is important for the lab to report if they did not achieve a result, the reason for that. So mm. there could be numerous reasons, one of which is uh, low fetal fraction. If, if the fetal fraction is, is too low, one may need to reconsider uh, testing again, especially if there's time constraints. But if the fetal fraction is sufficient and there's other reasons for uh, not achieving a result, that should be reported. So reason for uh, no result is, is also important. And that's uh, also applicable in singletons. Yeah. Good. Uh and maybe I would add, uh, I think in, in some ways, uh, the lab reports that we've seen, um, certainly looking at proficiency testing, the laboratories seem to sometimes assume that um, the results speak for themselves. And so making it abundantly clear, this is screen positive, it's screen negative, making clear it's a screen test. Uh, and then uh, as others have said, make, making some kind of explicit statement about the implications about what you would say differently about twins, uh, I think those would all be uh, very valuable things for laboratories to include. Yeah, yeah, Bob, you bring up a good point. I, I, I should have not have missed it. Um, we, as part of that survey that I showed you, the fetal fraction measurements in laboratories, we did ask questions about what would you say on the report for the clinical interpretation, uh, and it, and uh, a reasonably high proportion, not quite half, but almost. Um, the result was graded, uh, you know, inappropriate because it appeared as though they were saying it was diagnostic. The result was consistent with trisomy 21, for example, was one of the interpretations. That certainly sounds like you're saying uh, the fetus is affected with trisomy 21, um, at, whereas others um, uh, made it very clear that it was screen positive for trisomy 21. It was, um, uh, you know, that further studies should be done and so on. So I think laboratories should take care to be sure that they report this as a screening test, even though the predictive value is high, um, it, it is not diagnostic and, and that has to be made clear on the reports. Thank you. I think we have um, uh, time for one last question uh, and uh, a couple of people asked specifically about um, zygosity and chorionicity. Um, does anyone want to take that question? In particular, the, uh, in terms of interpreting based on zygosity, zygosity and chorionicity. Perhaps um, more in terms of um, the relationship of that to twinning. Well, Louise, you kind of covered that in, in, in the talk there. You want to address yeah. it, how, yeah. how that would change your interpretation among twins and what if it was monochorionic? Yeah. You know, you know, those, all those. Yeah, so I think, you know, and I would, yeah, no, exactly. That's, you know, it's, it's going to, um, you know, not only influence your risk if you have an abnormal and the person proceeds to a termination, 
Um, but I think even before that, when you're, as Rosa indicated, when you're submitting the report, I think, you know, with many of the genetic studies now, it's not just a matter of, you know, submitting a report and getting something back, but actually having some input from the sonologists and the sonographers as to, is this what, is this a monochorionic pregnancy? Are they the same sex? You know, those types of things can be very helpful um, when the lab is trying to sort out fetal fraction and such. So I think it's, you know, it's one more example of where we need to really um, have a much closer working relationship between the um, individuals who are doing some of the imaging studies and then the tests that are being run. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, and thank you to uh, Glenn and everyone here. So once again, um, so this will conclude our uh, final session for the ISPD Virtual Education Series of 2020. I wanna thank uh, all of you for joining us today and a special thank to our speakers, uh, Glenn, Louise, and the entire writing group for coming on uh, online and uh, addressing questions. The, this presentation will, uh, was recorded and it will be available at the ISPD website. Uh, CEUs are available for the first six sessions of the virtual education series, but are not available for today's presentation. An email has been sent out to you with an evaluation for the series and a separate email was also sent out with information regarding the claiming of the CEUs. Uh, certificates of attendance will be available for the entire series and will be sent out by ISPD within the next seven days. So once again, thank you all for attending today's session and have a wonderful uh, day ahead. Thank you and bye for now. Mm -hmm.